Parents, welcome to another episode of The Journey, a podcast intended to educate, equip, and entertain you as we talk about important issues facing our families. PCA is a Christ-centered, biblically-based, and family-focused community of committed believers doing life together. We hope the information you hear on this podcast informs and inspires you to be a better parent. Welcome to The Journey. All right, parents, welcome back to The Journey. This is Dan Panetti. I've got a a really good friend, a sweet friend, June Hunt. Um, The name might be uh, familiar to a lot of people. Um, I can't remember, 30-something years ago when I came to Dallas, it was such a blessing um, to get to meet you and to get to know you. Thank um, you. And just hope for the heart um, for people who know the Hope Center um, Mm -hmm. over on Plano Parkway. Uh, In fact, we were just there as a school. Um, ACSI had a conference there, and so we were just there at your fantastic ministry. How many ministries are a part of the Hope Center? Do you know? About 64 right now. That is incredible. And just that part of your ministry is so special um, that those organizations get to be a part of that center, um, utilize those facilities, which are incredible and fantastic. Um, and it's just it's such a neat way for you to use the blessings that God's given you and your ministry to bless other ministries as well. So thank you. Well, I remember having questions at times, not knowing what do I do in this situation? And I kept thinking, I wish there was somebody I knew who had my situation. Mm. My friends don't. But, you know, and, and I remember uh, there was a point at which someone said, well, June, you know, you could have a particular building and have a number of ministries. And uh, we ended up looking for the, the land and built a, a building of a hundred and eighty five thousand square feet, mm-hmm. but the point is they had to fit a biblical world view or every single ministry right. Right. they had to be a part of they had to literally live by what those uh tenants are from the bible and and um so there was commonality, yes, not just under the name a flagship of the word Christian, uh-huh. uh, because that can be all oh, the Christian it science. Be. It or could, can be, be, could be cool, so many you know, different yeah. things. So, so it's been phenomenal, yes. and people just bump into other leaders and uh, or people in ministry, and literally, it's the iron sharpening iron. That's so awesome. So, hope for the heart built it. Now we've spun it off into a zone five hundred one c three. Oh, that's so neat. So good. Well, there's so many things that I could talk to you about. In fact, you handed me as we were kind of preparing and and going through, you handed me some of the things that you're dealing with, dealing with difficult relationships um, and then hot topics and some of the things that you've been teaching on recently. um, And they go anywhere from abortion, bullying, uh, childhood, sexual abuse, domestic abuse, uh, homosexuality, same-sex marriage, cancel culture, suicide prevention, transgender. So this is just one (laughs) right and then the other one you're talking about relationships conflict resolution manipulation confrontation uh, vertical and emotional or verbal and emotional abuse forgiveness critical spirit codependency reconciliation and it's funny because i was talking to somebody i said oh well june hunt's going to be on the podcast you're like what are you going to talk to her about and i was like that's always the fun part right because the thing i love about talking to you is because your book that you use for guidance right is the bible there isn't anything we can't talk about. There are principles that the average person knows nothing about that are in the Bible. Yes. They have no idea that sometimes what they will even say, and I'm talking about people who are not Christians, they will believe a, a particular mindset, mm-hmm. and they don't even know it's biblical. That's right. But truth sets us free. Truth is trans cultural. Yes. It's around the globe. And so we need to be able to address, uh, and, and again, my, my joy for years uh, when we started, it was uh, literally 38 years ago mm. uh, on radio. And, and then I started writing uh, basically 100 topics and um, dealing with definitions, characteristics, causes, and solutions. The point of my saying that is I knew that there are times when there would be something really wrong, Mm -hmm. but it was like, for example, childhood sexual abuse. Not one Christian book was in existence. Mm -hmm. 
I knew the best book that was out, written by a homosexual woman and a uh, a, 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 a a mother uh, who had been. I don't, I don't know the credentials, but I just know. But it was not a Christian book, right. and I thought, how could there not be a Christian book on this topic when one in three girls, one in five boys, mm-hmm. are victims of childhood sexual abuse? Those statistics are staggering, yeah. and typically children don't talk about it. They they don't know how to. They haven't been trained. So there are all kinds of ways that we can help them, but. Um, a number of years ago, I started teaching this course, a three-year course called Counseling Through the Bible. And so we, and then we added more than the original 96, like verbal and emotional abuse. Jesus, is he God? Yes, I should have had that in there. But <clears throat> the point is, um, people want to know so many. It's like, oh, if God said it in his word, if it's authoritative, right. Okay, then I will believe it if God said it. And all Scripture is useful That's right. for yeah. confronting, rebuking, uh, but, but helping us all think as God wants us to think. Yeah. That's, that's one of the great things about the Bible is it doesn't leave us wondering right. about what is true, about what is right, about what is good, and how to live in accordance with those particular principles. And so if you want to know, that's the great thing is you can go to the Word of God and you can see and understand here's how God has designed things for them to work according to His design. Now, you don't have to live that way. <laughs> you can choose not to, right? But the pain and the suffering and the heartache that comes with it is because you've chosen to reject the design and right. the designer, right? And that's one of the things that, you, that you've been able to help people understand that that's, that's what that pain shows, right? Just like when you, when you touch a hot stove and you pull your hand away, right? You've been given these sensors to help you understand, oh, that's painful. Be careful of that. And God's given us those same principles in life as well. I love that illustration. Um, by the way, I, I, I know that you, your forte is helping people think mm. biblically. Yes. And I'm not talking about just one strata. We are talking about parents. You're right. talking about students. Uh, people who are uh, faculty members. We all need to know how to think biblically, and many times we were just not exposed. I mean, I started out not knowing anything. Mm. I had no Bible. Well, I knew the Lord's Prayer because of a church I had been in, but there was no Bible taught at all in Sunday school or anything like that. So I, I know what it's like to then see all these other students. Right. Who I thought, how do they know that? Yeah, you feel ill-equipped and oh. overwhelmed, and and they could actually turn. I mean, <laughs> if, I mean, I had no idea how to open a Bible and go anywhere. Yeah. So, um, and and you can't help what family you grew up in right. or what the conditions were. And some of us grew up in painful homes, but we don't have to stay there as adults. Uh, the scripture is is very clear. When I was a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but now that I'm an adult, yes. I put childish ways behind me. So I've got to be able to think in a way that is right in God's sight. And, it, and then, oh my goodness, you know, everybody, Dan, looks for at least one person who's wise. That's right. Everyone wants to know a wise person. Yeah. Now, when you're that wise person, you don't ever have to worry about being lonely. I mean, you're going to have all these people who will want and need wise counsel That's from right. you. That's right. So I think it's a privilege to be able to deal with not just principles, but what, what, how do you solve this problem? What do you do when this is a sticky situation? Mm. And so that's our joy at Hope for the Heart, our ministry, um, whether it's on radio with Hope in the Night, a call-in counseling program. It doesn't matter. People all around want, they're looking for someone wise. And why not it be you? Yeah. That's what I love. Psalm 119, 130 says, right, the unveiling of God's word gives wisdom to the simple. Huh. So you may not think of yourself as a wise person, but that's okay. If you have the word of God, it's his wisdom that you're sharing anyway. 
And you're so going to learn that's what you as do. over time. You're going right. to learn. Implement how it and put it into practice, and wisdom will come with it. That will. Yes. Thank you. So one of the things we want to talk about, um, you actually have a resource, a book called Bonding with Your Child Through Boundaries. And it's kind of an interesting perspective because um, right now, permissive parenting, mm-hmm. um, parents who want to be friends with their kids, it's very difficult to say no. Um, everybody else is doing it, and so why can't we? That's kind of the, the mainstream. But you would say... Um, that boundaries are healthy, and not just for the child, but really for that parent-child relationship, um, that you need to establish those boundaries, and you need to be able to um, say no to certain things. And so help our parents understand, what, is that, what does that look like um, when you're parenting through boundaries? How do you uh, figure out what those boundaries are, and how do you establish some of those healthy boundaries with your kids? Well, as a former youth director, <clears throat> I could see families that were thriving Mm -hmm. and some where the kids were, um, whether you call it rebelling, there were some rebels, but are some that just weren't thriving. And at the time, I had been just a uh, a, a college student and the pastor at my church said, you are going to be our junior high <laughs> director. And there were 600 oh, in the junior high division. And much later, I wrote the book I needed called Bonding with Your Teen Through mm. Boundaries. What I learned is um, because I became a true, authentic Christian through the youth ministry, mm-hmm. I knew what it was like to have a changed life through Christ. Right. And what I saw were all these kids that they had something. I didn't know what they had. Whatever it was, I wanted. And then having a changed life myself and having no exposure, though, before that, no exposure to authentic Christianity, I thought, what a shame. Why why didn't I hear? I Mm -hmm. I was in a church. Why did I not... Any, anybody explain about having a personal relationship with mm. Jesus Christ? That was foreign language. And I thought, you know, there's so many people who they want to do what's right, yeah. but they just don't have exposure. So this is why this type of podcast or this opportunity to, to deal with real issues are huge yeah. because you can't help what you don't know. But you can later learn, that's right. and that's part of the iron sharpening iron, be around other people. And as I think about it, um, I, I remember my first day on the job, there was a, a boy who was uh, on, he was where we were going to help people the kids know to go to the right, go to the left, mm-hmm. you know, arrows and all. And he was tearing the slats down okay. in the afternoon. <laughs> and I thought, interesting. Yeah. So I slowly walked up to him and I said, hi, I'm June. My name is June. Uh, and I'm the new youth director here, the junior high director. Um, what's your name? Jerry. I said, hi, Jerry. Um, I just wonder, would you be able, on occasion, if I don't know someone's name and I don't won't know their names, could I say, Jerry, who is that? Do you do you know the kids here? Well, and he he, he wasn't real committal, but then I said, you know, there might be some things I would need to really know. That where you could help me, and now he kind of mm-hmm. looked up and because instead of being destructive, I said, "By the way, I've got a whole bunch of watermelons. I've got to get on the top floor, four floors. Do you have some buddies?" And you know, and now he started flexing his muscle. He kind of moved his shoulders a certain way, and and I kind of flexed his muscles. I said, "I would really appreciate it if you could get some buddies." to help get these watermelons four flights up. Okay. Well, the point is, I later learned he had 
come, he was in a family, five boys, no dad mm. in the home. Uh, the mom works two jobs, and he's the middle child. And later, I saw him um, on a bus, on a choir tour, just a loner. People didn't sit with him, and he had a book. And I said, um, hey, hey, Jerry, what's your book? And I, he, then he kind of showed it to me, F stops. I said, F stops? You mean cameras? He said, yes. And I said, do you like cameras? Yeah. And I said, uh, well, what kind of camera do you have? And they just looked at his shoes. I don't have a camera. I said, well, if I got you a camera and got you the film, paid for the film, mm. would you be our official photographer for all of these events that we're doing? And he looked at me. Yeah. yeah. And in his senior year, he brought me the annual and it said Jerry Quillen photography oh, wow. for all this and you know like several thousand students and later in the summer he drowned and then a year later his mom came up to me he said June there were only two people who believed in Jerry yeah. it was you and the choir director and he said she, she said, it just changed his life. So we don't know what the potential is. Mm. Now, there is such a thing as a boundary. Mm -hmm. A boundary is a line that should not be crossed if there's a, a rule, a law. Sure. In our culture, that's a whole other story. Yes, but uh, <laughs> But let's talk about personal boundaries. Okay. Okay. So if there's a line that should not be crossed... And let's say the parents say, we don't want our children doing this, okay. whatever it is. Sure. And it obviously, you'd say stealing, um, hitting, mm -hmm. um, drugs, all these things. If the line is crossed, there's a repercussion, two R's. Repercussion, if they cross the line. Reward, if they don't. Okay. Repercussion, reward repercussion, reward. And the point of that is we need to be clear that you're going to choose. Dan, let's say you're a young boy. Mm -hmm. Relatively and, young. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and uh, you're told, uh, do not, do not, okay, let's say you're, you're 16, mm -hmm. and you have a driver's license. Mm -hmm. I new, new driver's license. Gotcha. And mom and dad say, you've got to be very aware you don't drive on a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. What if you think, hey, that's no big deal. And so you're starting to drive on the sidewalk. You know, you're on the the main road, but then you go over on the sidewalk. What could happen to you? Lots of bad things. Like what? I could hit somebody. That's I, right. I could get a ticket. Yeah, especially if the policeman's right there. That's right. And if you start acting out, uh, you could be taken in. Yeah. Um, you know, your car could be hurt by hitting property, all yeah. kinds of things. Yes. There are repercussions that are very, um, they're important because if you're a guy with a new car, meaning it new to you, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to want to continue to be able to drive that car. That's right. But if your dad had said, son, if you violate the law on, that's on the books for driving, um, that means we will have to withdraw your privilege of driving. Yes. Well, but you think, no big deal, you know, parents say this. Oh, and then all of a sudden now you have 
gotten a ticket for driving on the sidewalk. Um, what do you think a parent should do because that son got a ticket? Dan Panetti got the ticket. Yeah, follow through on what they said. Yeah. The follow through is going to be the most important yeah. part. And this is where many parents, they can be good people, but not good parents if they don't follow through. Yeah. Uh, that, that act of literally saying, son, we want you to drive the car. Mm-hmm. That's why you're, you have it. But you've chosen the repercussion. You have chosen to now not have use of that car for a week or two weeks or whatever it is. Right. And that is what is valuable about boundaries. It's not that you're a mean dad, mean mom, mm-hmm. if you literally follow through of the, on the repercussion. But do you understand it's the the son, the daughter, who is choosing actually to receive the repercussion by their actions, right. yeah. as long as they knew that it was wrong. Yeah. So, what we did in this book, um, bonding with your child through boundaries, um, the publisher said, "Would you do the, this book not just for teen teens, but for also?" Uh, for for children, so we have age appropriate boundaries that are very practical. So either book uh, depends on the age of the kids. Yeah. Is there such thing as a bad boundary? As I'm a, as I'm a parent and I'm establishing those boundaries, um, I mean, because here's the thing: the the Word of God doesn't give me necessarily principles over all aspects of parenting, and in terms Correct. of. Um, you know, when do I give my child a cell phone and how much time do I let them stay on? And I don't remember anything about Snapchat in God's word. Um, I do know it's a waste of time for kids yeah. to be on. Uh, we'll just throw that in there for parents. But how, is there a bad boundary, though? I mean, you know, do I do I look at what everybody else is doing in setting the boundaries? How do I figure that out? Well, let's consider this. Let's say there is an event that is a, a school event. Mm -hmm. Uh, It could be a sports event. It could be something that will typically uh, be over at nine o'clock. Now, if you say, well, you have to be in by nine o'clock, that there's no drive time to move. Don't take into consideration just things that Right. You're yeah. Just, so, you're, you're, yeah. You're placing the boundaries because they need a boundary, but you're not really thinking through right. all the implications. And and therefore, to be wise mm-hmm. about what you're doing, um, I, I think it 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 at issue is 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 this an issue of rebellion? And many times it is. Mm-hmm. I received a call from um, a pastor's wife. No, I'm sorry, a daughter, and she had a a seventeen, no, fifteen year old son. Okay, and <clears throat> I was very surprised. I got pulled in on this um, uh, recently, and when I talked with the two parents, um, they said, "Well, we have boundaries, but we've been lax." Okay, and <clears throat> so it ended up that. The pastor had me come to the church in Birmingham, Alabama, and address this whole thing for the parents and um, the leadership. Because it can seem, oh, I'm being a nice parent, um, to not go through with the repercussion. But no, you're, you're, you're training kids to disobey. You're training them to not follow through. That's a good way to put it. And <clears throat> we have to be aware it's repetition that enforces what is right. Yeah. So, um, and and she said, and this is somebody who was wise in the Lord and all, but she said, this is an area we just let him get away with a number of things 
and now it's escalated. Yeah. And so I said, you've got to be consistent. And you can say, you know, son, um, we love you and we'll always love you. We're for you. We'll always be for you. But you've chosen at times to go against our house rules. Mm -hmm. And the house rules are designed to do what is right. And by the way, who can set the house rules? Who pays for the house? Whether it's an apartment, but that abode where that child is there, they're the ones, the the parents or, or whoever's paying for it. Well, and I always ask that question if I'm talking with the kid. Well, you know, tell me, uh, now who is, uh, I'm thinking about a girl right now, and she was upset that her parents were requiring her to check in mm -hmm. for something. Mm -hmm. How unfair. <clears throat> How, yeah, t <laughs> yeah, totally unfair. And she knew I would uh, agree with her because her parents were not the best. But... I said, now, who pays for the roof over your head? And she was surprised. I, she said, Mom. And I said, and who's paying for the food that you eat and your education? Mom. I said, then, yes, once a week, if she says we need to check in we need to talk right yeah and she was stunned she because she knew I would take her side no and and the point there is it's appropriate for parents to set house rules mm -hmm. what whether, whether you call it something else that's fine uh, that's not the issue it's looking at what is in the best interest of Helping your child for the future right. is kind of preparing your kite for flight. Um, there are times when you need to run with the kite if, you've, if you're into kites. <clears throat> and it's been a while since I've flown a kite, but I, I remember you have to run for a while, and then you increase the string as you run, and, and that's what we do. Yep. We allow more and more strings so the, the kite can fly higher and higher. Yeah, so good, so good. Um, thinking of just a real life scenario, I mean, I, I can think of so many different things, right? But you've um, obviously had, uh, you know, exposure, um, you know, just as you've walked through um, life, not only your own life, but, um, you know, your, your counseling um just kind of give us an example of what you know a parent might deal with with a child, um, kind of how to how to set that boundary and then what to do specifically again, right? When that child either violates that or um, you know even the reward aspect, what is what does that look like? Well, <clears throat> first of all, think about children, little ones, mm -hmm. little tykes, and they have been given. A tricycle. Mm. Well, they're going to wa want to go out and ride that tricycle. And they're told, do not go beyond the curb. Yep. You cannot go into the street. Yep. You must not go into the street. Well, let's say mom is looking out the window all of a sudden she's thinking, oh, no. And there could be some teenagers who are actually riding bikes on the street. So do you just let her, this little girl, uh, ride the tricycle in the middle of the street? I hope not. No. <laughs> I mean, you're responsible for helping them understand they they don't have a great comprehension of danger right. I mean kids they don't mind putting their hands on a <clears throat> hot stove until all of a sudden they now withdraw yeah. appropriately so because it's 
burning their hands, but they don't get it until they experience it. So what we would have to understand is if you say, do not ever, you must never ride your tricycle in the street because you can be killed. Understanding that the parents will understand much more about danger, but the, the boundary would be, and if you do this, then you will not be able to ride your tricycle and you decide what the time is for a period of time because typically they would want to be able to get back on that tricycle. Same would be true for a bicycle. But you start early, early with children. And Do you think some parents, so let's say uh, you're you're watching out the window and they're riding in the street and, and nothing happens. Right? So now it's the, oh, well, they were in the street and they should get a consequence, but because nothing happened, right? now I don't want to be the bad guy and come in there and take, take the tricycle away, take the phone away, take the, this away, because really nothing happened. And they, they wait for, in a sense, something bad to happen, and they just right? they put boundaries, but they just hope that nothing bad happens, even if you violate the boundaries. Then you're training a child to be dangerous, mm. and you... You, you know better. You, you're the adult. Yeah. And the question is, who's going to be the adult in the home? It needs to be the adult. It needs to be the parent or the guardian. Um, you're, you're not creating a hardship if you say, honey, I'm for you. I, I want you to be able to ride your tricycle or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, I want you to be able to use the car. But if you choose to do this, um, I, I, I remember one day I was sitting on an airplane and I was next to a, a student, a college student, and I said, Tell me, um, did your parents? ever have a boundary for you that you exceeded and you had a repercussion. Okay. So, yes. Mm. I said, could you tell me what happened? And he said, I I grew up in Tyler, Texas, and uh, I'm a student at um, A&M. My senior year, I um, didn't think my parents would know what time I came in, so Mm -hmm. I came in at 2 o'clock, and they were both sitting there waiting for Mm -hmm. me. And then they withdrew my car privilege in my senior year for two weeks. I said, did you feel that that was excessive? He said, yes. Yes. At the time, he said, "But I think all kids would say that." I said, "Well, what happened?" He said, "I had to get friends to come by and pick me up on school days. They had to pick me up, and if I had an extracurricular activity, had they'd have ride. to take me there. Mm-hmm. And different ones would have to do things because." of things I was involved in, I said, what do you think has been the impact? Was there any impact on you later? He said, yes. Today at A&M, as a student, I watch my watch like a hawk. Mm -hmm. And I put that down. I wrote that down. I watch my watch like a hawk to make sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. That's right. He said, because of that repercussion, um, I really felt that um, I, I, it impacted the way I viewed time. I said, how do you feel about your parents doing what they did, knowing it was a challenge for you to get rides? He said, I think they're great. I think they're just great. And so it's kind of like, Parents can at times be
be afraid of accused being accused of wearing a black hat. Mm -hmm. The parents don't want to be the villain. A dad doesn't want to be the villain. And they think, oh, I don't want my son, my daughter to get upset with me. But, you know, when I thought about that guy, that student, when he came back and said, I think my parents are great. And when he said that, it dawned on me, the parent who could, could be viewed as wearing the black hat finds that later the hat turns white. Mm. Uh, in uh, Westerns, years and years ago, you always knew who the villain was. It was the guy with the black hat. Yep. The, the hero was always the guy with the white hat. And in time, your kids will have perspective. Yep. And I, I think it, there's one thing that's important, Dan. A lot of parents do not know, much less the students themselves. They don't know that the brain does not fully develop until age 25 to 28. The brain is not fully developed. And so what they're thinking is okay or right mm -hmm. may not be at all aligned to what's best for their brains. And so those that are, are ingesting certain things that can very much uh, just harm their their body, yeah. um, they don't, it, it's not reality to them. So just be aware that you have to, as a parent, take responsibility to do what's best in behalf of your son or daughter. Yeah. In fact, what is so obvious is much, much later, and I've seen this happen over and over again, those who had parents that had right kinds of healthy boundaries, mm -hmm. uh, the kids come back and say, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I needed what you exposed me to. I didn't see it at the time, and I didn't want the repercussion, but I see that it was beneficial for me yeah. in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. It may be easier to be a permissive parent and the kids may like it better, but nobody when they get older is ever thankful for those permissive parents. So I love that you've written a great book, Bonding, Bonding with Your Child Through Boundaries, the Importance of Boundaries, Helping Some Parents Understand um, How to Establish Them, How to uh, Enforce Them, and, uh, mm -hmm. and it's, it's for the betterment of not only the child when they're young, keeping yes. them safe, but it's to help them to be a successful adult as well. And I think that's the important part of parenting. Um, just at the end, I want to mention, because uh, one of the great things you do is um, you do so many great things to help the church. And as a Christian school, as a part of a church, um, we're so much um, a, a beneficiary of this. Um, but in June, there's a note here, it's June 22nd. You're actually hosting an event uh, dealing with um, mental health and the church. Such an important thing. I think um, maybe one of the great things that we've seen over the last five to maybe 10 years is where uh, mental health awareness has gotten a little bit more of its due, uh, that people are paying attention to our mental health, not just our physical health, not just our spiritual health, but we are body, soul, and spirit. And so just our minds and, and, and uh, that whole thing uh, is such an important because you've been on it for years and I'm glad that you're helping train the church and so many people are, are, are paying attention to this as well. So there's going to be a great event. Uh, we will put more, uh, a link to it, right? Uh, hopefortheheart.org slash church is going to be where you can go and you can find out more about that. Anything you want to say on that in particular? There's a, a big concern of a number of young people. They uh, are struggling, in, in, or, or parents, mm. uh, with depression, yeah. uh, anxiety. anxiety. Huge yes. has now even been more uh, on the increase than, than depression, so anxiety. Suicide uh, hurts my heart. i when I realize yeah. so many snuff out their lives. And I think it's vital that they understand. Uh, I was with a 13-year-old, and uh, he had already written a suicide note mm. to his parents and to his siblings. Oh, and he was a redhead, um, and his mom worked 
at our ministry in my home office. And uh, she told me about this. I said, would I be happy to talk with Lincoln if you wish? And so I did talk with him, and she wanted that. I said, Lincoln, I want you to be aware of one vital scripture. God says, I know the plans I have for you, Mm -hmm. plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Now, if he says, I know the plans I have for you, Lincoln, you don't have to know the plan. You don't have to know the multiple plans. He says, the one who created you, and this is Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. That should be written down in your Bibles or underlined in your Bibles mm-hmm. uh, or write it down on a card. And I had him to write it down on a card. I said, do you understand the God who created you has plans for you? You won't know the plans, but he knows the plans. Your job is to yield your will to his plan, giving Jesus control of your life. And he was willing to do that. He was being bullied at school. Mm -hmm. He's a redhead, and so they were kidding him about that. And he was not that tall. And um, what stunned me was a month later, he enrolled for school. And all of a sudden, he was assigned a different school. And then he ends up being on the football team. And I'm, I said to his mother, he must be very fast because he wasn't big, mm-hmm. he wasn't brawny. Mm-hmm. She said, he's very, very fast. I said, is he a receiver? She said, yes, he's good at that. His hands are really good. So I, and I did not expect that fast to turn around. But I asked that mother yesterday, tell me about Lincoln. Mm-hmm. She said he loves school now. And so there was a whole huge, there was a huge change. Yeah. I, I, th- I think that's one of the great things, right, is uh, there may be some difficulties that our kids are going through, some, some hardships. Um, but if you can help them um, and find a connection, especially with an adult, right, that can see, as you said, uh, see the Lord's potential in their life, the plans that he has for them, and you can help them to, to begin to see it. Uh, our kids can make it through some difficult things, even bullying and other kids their own age. That's one of the biggest oh. things. Other kids their own age, right? When a young person looks at other people their own age and thinks what they think about them is important, it's like, no, they're they're just as young and dumb as you are, right? What does God say about you? And then what do some adults see in you? I think that's what we need to make sure that we remind our kids of because, you know, the adults can see the hope and the potential and the value. And in they the need person, to hear. And they need to hear they it. We need, need we to... need to say it to them, yes. right? When you see value in a person, a young person's life, Speak that into them and, and tell them what you see as, as God's design for them. That's and I had design. him, re- I said, I want you to read this in the morning mm. when you wake up. I want you to read it sometime during the day, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, yeah. and sometime before you go to bed. Read that and thank him that he has the plan for you. Amazing. Amazing. Well, June, thank you so much. Thanks for your years of ministry, an incredible organization that has blessed so many people and is blessing our school um, and just our parents as well. So we appreciate your time. My joy. Thank Thank you. Thank you for investing the time to listen to this episode of The Journey. Please take a minute to share with friends and family who will also benefit from this valuable resource. And don't forget to rate and review this podcast on your favorite podcast app. It is truly our blessing and honor to walk with you on The Journey.